Uh, thank you so much, Craig, for your overly generous introduction and for your generosity in allowing me to come here again. I have been here many times. I feel very much at home. Uh, to me, like Alibaba coming into his treasure trove by saying, oh, it says on it. The difference is that you don't have to say anything except, I want to see the needs for life and you are allowed. It is open for everybody, it's around the world, connected uh, electronically, and uh, it is a gorgeous place. And I am asked to tell you about uh, the early years, why it was needed, what it accomplished very roughly, and then why it is needed in the future even more. And uh, I have also, uh, of course, been very moved by the idea of this is an anniversary, namely that uh, Robert Oppenheimer uh, opened the Needs for Library just 50 years and two days ago. And this uh, is one of the reasons for our holding it just now. And uh, this uh, allows me to talk a little about Robert. I will call him uh, Robert as long as I can and Oppie when I slip. Uh, so you men. Have. And then you see him. Uh, you know, history is made chiefly by people, by uh, <laughs> by ideas, as Hegel thought. And uh, his own history reflects the course of uh, science in America as well. So there are two reasons for me to talk about him here. Uh, I'll begin with his eloquent remarks, just two sentences, which really apply today as he was speaking 50 years ago in the Niels Bohr Library to launch it. And you see him here, September 26, 1962. He says the following to start. We meet on an occasion of particular sweetness at the home and center of a constellation of enterprises in which all of us have deep hope and deep interest. I do not suppose that any one of us could keep away from an occasion that is associated with the name of Paul, and I'm also very happy to start by expressing again the gratitude of a whole community for the request that the Heinemann family family has made to the Institute, to which we now can happily add a number of other gifts uh, for the time being. So, uh, I said there may be something compelling for Robert attending here 50 years ago at the old stage, which then took place then in New York. Well, for one thing, we now know, of course, from his archives, which are in the Library of Congress largely, that unbeknownst to us, Robert had intended to write a history of uh, theoretical physics in the 20th century himself. He was deeply interested in the history of science. It comes through in the rest of his talk in 1962, how the work here would help us to know what the scientists think, and importantly, quote, how they were led to think it, unquote. He called the history of physics a particularly rich field and rich hope, and especially pointed to the use of findings here for the education of young people. I shall expand a bit on this profound mission later, but the Robert goes beyond this to claim rightly that the work being done here is also the highest value in giving the proper place of science fully understood in our culture as a whole. Unquote. For as you said, and I quote again, the discoveries in the sciences are among the great epics, and they should be available in our tradition, conducive to the understanding of the elements that show an underlying unity in human life. Unquote. And of course, the name Niels Bohr given to this enterprise, had demanded from Robert, who mentioned Paul twice in this talk, 50 years ago, a special respect. After all, Paul <coughs> had met uh, Robert often. Paul was with Robert at Los Alamos. Uh, Robert uh, he persuaded Niels Paul to go to FDR to argue for the internationalization of atomic energy, which, alas, never happened. And uh, Paul's, uh, Robert also published a touching essay on Paul later on. But this 
Pope for a phrase, the unity in human life, reminds us that the time when he spoke, and there was some darkness in the rest of his speech, at the time when he spoke 50 years ago, the world was in a state of chaos. In many ways, it is again, now, 50 years later. In 62, when he was spoke, speaking, the Bay of Pigs disaster of the previous year, together with the intransigence of the Soviets, as seen in the Berlin debacle of that time, was leading to the missile crisis that happened very few weeks later. The unraveling in Vietnam uh, was turning serious. The ardent search for civil rights was escalating into terrible confrontations in 1962. But for Robert personally, there was also some ominous concern just then. Perhaps I may speak, speak briefly about that because we know each other well and we often met and talked. A few years earlier, Einstein had died without being uh, interviewed by an oral historian, and then Erwin Schrödinger died in 1961. No, Niels Bohr was quite weak and would soon be dead in a few weeks after that meeting. Uh, perhaps most shaking to Robert was the news that the physicist philosopher P.W. Bridgman had Harvard had killed himself, having suffered unbearably from cancer. And there you see Robert standing gaunt with cancer in his throat, knowing that it was terminal. He had been very close to Bridgman. He had actually selected Bridgman as the only serious scientist at Harvard when he was a freshman. <laughs> and uh, he persuaded Bridgman to let him work in his lab for his BA thesis on high pressure uh, effects on crystals. Why crystals? Because as a child, he had gotten from the orchids how some crystals to look at, how the various links intersect themselves. So there he was uh, for about three years, he tried quickly, as, and he also then later spoke mo movingly at Bridgman's a retirement. He often had met with him and with us. He was the head of the visiting committee at the physics department. Harvard. We saw him often. But now think. He was a young physicist in the early 1920s. Then a physicist in America thought himself primarily as an experimentalist. And here he was trying to become an experimentalist in the lab of a great experimentalist. There were two boxes in the lab at that time, Richmond told me later with great joy. One box was for the equipment which uh, Robert ruined while <laughs> by overcharging his carbonometers. Uh, the other second box was for the money to replace the family. <laughs> so that was America then for Robert. He went to Cavendish Lab to do more experimental physics, and by great accident, Max Born walks in, and they pers and persuades him to become a theoretical physicist. <laughs> this was the day not yet of a John Wheeler, or a Eugene Wigner, or a Van Bleck, a Schwinger, a Weinberg, a, you name them, you know them all. That was the early time of American science. But having all said all this, as if by the way, it becomes clear why AIP chose Robert to give this inaugural speech and why I have focused on him now. His career embodied the whole arc for American physics from these early beginnings where people had to go to Europe, as Robert did, in order to learn their physics until the tales were turned and now it is the world class place to learn some physics uh, in a global environment. We have become globalized and the US is, of course, a top man. So it is right here in this archive, in the books in this building, the access to finding aids which we have uh, to find the uh, rise of physics in America and worldwide. Now, 
Let's turn this off. I have to speak about the early founding years. And what happened behind the scenes before this picture was taken? For several years, the key person there was another great man, the director of the ARP at that time, who served from 1957 to 1964, Elmer Hutchison. Let's have the picture of oh, Elmer. Sorry. <laughs> Elmer Hutchison was a deeply cultured man, married to Rose Valencia, who had herself gotten an advanced degree in history, and he himself was devoted to the history of science. In, it, in the late 1950s, he heard that the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. was planning a new building to exhibit progress in science and in technology. And in that building, the Smithsonian was to going to have physics in America relegated to a little corner in the room for electrical and nuclear engineering. <laughs> to Elmer, this was unacceptable. I don't know to this day why Elmer sent me to the Smithsonian to talk sense to him. I went. I mean, a man in his 30s, essentially unknown, meeting Lemon Carmichael himself a great man in charge of the Smithsonian, a biologist who was especially versed on experimental psychology with primates. In fact, he himself was a very big primate. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he heard me out just for a few sentences. And he said, you want me to redesign that building? Who is AIP anyway? Come to the window. What do you see? We are on a high floor. I said, I see nothing except buses. Yes, he said. Buses all around the building. People come by the thousands. Don't tell me how to run a museum. <laughs> <laughs> well, this was not the big bang, it was the big prison. <laughs> because what happened next was that um, I had to report this dismal failure to Elma. Well, Elmer was stoical, and he said, so we have a job of education to do. And so he invited me to help initiate, it, initiate a committee on the history and philosophy of physics. It was a one-man operation, starting with, a starting with making a list of potential interviewees. There was no push from the physics society. There was no external funds. It was a quiet experiment. And if it failed, you could sort of bury it quietly in a family celebration. <laughs> but this didn't cause too much trouble. So it all started on a shoestring. It did become more of a reality when the NSF gave us a five-year grant from 1961 on. Then in 62, inauguration of the Leeds War Library, as you've just seen. And in 1965, Board of Governors of AIP allowed a Center for History of Physics to appear, which also pioneered in uh, geophysics and astronomy and in related physical sciences. Now, following the AIP leadership in this enterprise of making history count, history matter, others picked it up. This is an important part of the story because the chemists saw what we were doing, and they found it an equivalent over in Philadelphia, which is going very well. And so did the IEEE, and so did the IT. So there are children and grandchildren of this enterprise which take care of more science. But it was important that it was really people who did it with their devotion and their work. And there we know it is Bill King and Bill Kelly, Charles Weiner, <coughs> John Warnow, Spencer Wert, and uh, Greg Good's team here, Anderson and all the rest. The supporters at the time, in the early 1960s, were essential because the 
point of tardiness of AIP wasn't so sure that this might not be a brain on the body. So it took people on the board, like Fred Seitz and Manny Fiore from MIN, from IBM, to speak up for it when uh, there was a temporary negative um, <clears throat> amount of money available. In fact, during the board meetings, we had a great time. And <laughs> I was very keen on attending as member of the board, provided the Eastern Airline shuttle from Boston would come on time. And of course, it all was due to the great passion of airline purchasing itself. Some reminder of airline deserves indeed to be part of our celebration. What about it? In the mid 1920s, he did his PhD work in physics at the University of Minnesota, which has just been mentioned uh, by our prize winner. He worked under a young professor named John H. Van Leck at Minnesota, well before Van came to Harvard. No doubt it was not easy for Elmer to do this, to work on the van. I still shudder thinking of the group theory, of course. <laughs> in which, uh, the main thing that would happen is that after the hour of his lectures, the whole class was sort of sworn to adjourn to try to find out what was it that was being said. <laughs> <laughs> so we told each other that it was this, this uh, energy which made us do it. Well, Elmer, after his PhD, he went to the University of Pittsburgh as professor in physics. He took a year off in 1929 to go to Berlin to work, believe it or not, with Erich Schrödinger. In 1957, he got a telephone call from Fred Seitz to ask him to become the second director of AIP. It was tough to not say yes to Fred Seitz. There, Elmer started a section on education, <coughs> being deeply disturbed by the illiteracy of science in America. You can find out much more about him and his time by, of course, a detailed archive oral history interview right here in this building, conducted by Charles Weiner and available together with 1,200 others made locally and at this very archive and also with many of them free on the internet. In this interview, Elmer looked back on his whole career and he said that the most proud achievement in his life was the establishment of the Needs for Library, the Archive, and the Center. What he, of course, didn't mention there was that in his will, he included a most generous donation to the AIP Foreign Endowment Fund for the Needs for Library and Archive. Now, reading this interview, and so many others here, made me think of the challenging talk given by William James in around 1890 to uh, undergraduates on a topic must have been puzzling to them. The topic was, what makes a life worth living? His answer was that such a life would involve nothing that comes easy. It were to involve a real fight, a struggle, and not war. A fight in which something is eternally gained for science. Where one has the courage to stake one's life on a possibility. Unquote. And this comes through again and again from the documents in this archive, in the stories of the work of the physical scientists. And perhaps that view of a life that is worth living helps explain why the name Niels Bohr was chosen for this uh, uh, enterprise here. And now let's have the picture of Niels Bohr, if I may. Because Bohr's life and his work, they are ideals, they are icons for physicists and even for science itself. His integrity was so detailed that it sometimes verged on the comic. Let me tell you a story about that. He was, like almost everybody I speak about, somebody I got to know. He came to Cambridge uh, twice, and uh, once he was invited to give a talk at the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. It was a talk 
courageously entitled On Atoms and Human Knowledge. I think that's. <laughs> Um, there were two people to sit near where he spoke, so that you could hear him well, he was mumbling a little, <laughs> um, uh, to be uh, interrogators afterwards and commentators. One of them was Philip Frank, the great physicist and philosopher, and the other was Robert Oppenheimer. There was trouble. I was in the room. Uh, they became more and more puzzled. They didn't understand very much what was going on, nor anybody else. And uh, yet, I was asked by the Academy to publish the talk. <laughs> so afterwards, I asked him for the manuscript, and I said, Professor Paul, it has been suggested that I try to edit it. <laughs> oh, I said, yes, this often has happened to me. Um, yes, yes, people want to edit what I gave. Well, here it is, you try out. And so I did, and I came back to him, and he, he read it carefully, and then he smiled, and he said, oh, just one little plea, publish it exactly as I gave it. <laughs> 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 I do, but I had the courage to ask him, Professor Paul, why is it that you so often speak in such a rather obscure way? difficult. And he said, well, this is the point of the story. I do not choose to write or speak more clearly than I think. <laughs> <laughs> this, I say, is taking integrity too far. <laughs> so, uh, something else happened as a result of that. Brett Bridgman was there too. Bridgman was enraged by this talk, particularly after it was published. And he said, I've got to publish a reply to it. And he did. And in his reply, he said, I don't see what complementarity is all about. This talk was mostly, Boas talk was mostly about complementarity. I don't see what this is all about. Uh, I mean, the electron can be in a complementarity way, both a uh, particle and a wave. But you know, I'm an operationalist, and uh, in one case, it's a wave electron, and the other case, it is a public electron, and they're different equipment, and you always have to be operational about it and involve the equipment. So sometimes it is a kind of microscope electron, and sometimes it's a kind of diffraction rating electron. <coughs> These are not the same thing, just as length is not the same when you do a centimeter here, and then try to get the number of light years out there. That's different equipment. One may be very differently calibrated compared to the other. Well, um, Bridge, when I say was an operationalist, let me just underline this because he comes finally back into our story again. I was a student in his lab, got my degree there, PhD. And uh, he was indeed all the way to his toenails and operation. <laughs> One day, early in the morning, I was working in the machine shop, and uh, the telephone rang. And the voice there said, uh, we are told that uh, Professor Bridgman doesn't have a telephone in this office, which is true, he never had a phone. And uh, please bring me to him. This is supposed to be the nearest place. Go and get it for us. I said, no, no way. <laughs> no, in the evening. No, but this is important. You want a Nobel Prize. <laughs> so, that's why I had some. Uh, I went into the lab and said, Professor Bridgman, for once, come to the phone. Well, he was on the four press, the kerosene pump, which gets the first 2,000 atmospheres into the press. And he said, memorably, tell him, I believe it when I see it. <laughs> <laughs> but I <have> to <laughs> this is op operationalism. <laughs> <laughs> well, what is, let's turn this off now, <clears throat> what is this 
this enterprise about. And you'll hear about it, I think, from Greg and company. But I want to just say, this treasure trove has a website. If you are puzzling after today, you can look it up. Niels Bohr Library and Archives. And you see some short description. The online catalog, International Archives, to find your interview with Bohr, right where it is, comes up. Archival finding aids, photographs, thousands and thousands of them, and the Segrave People Archive set. The oral histories, transcripts, some to be read online, and the history of, intrinsic, history of physics, also industry and government included, and the other physical sciences. Oral histories, collections, grants being administrated, exhibits being made, which isn't even on the website, supply, and uh, aids to scholars, advising people constantly where to find a new archive and how to deal with it, and excellent articles as well on the work of physicists today, including those by Spencer Webb. And uh, I must say a word about Spencer. Spencer spent nearly four decades of his life in this place. I mentioned this list of people who have been helpful. But Spencer is special. And uh, not only through his books, which you know, and his articles, and his blog, and his uh, website, but uh, by seeing what is the best way to go forward in this case. So we are really the beneficiaries of people's passions and dedications, such as Spencer and I. I wish to just have mentioned him that here. All right, now to my last segment. Uh, one may ask still, why is all this here? Why does it continue to be here? Why is it going to have to be expanded? Why will more funds be needed? My first answer is this. Most obviously, we all know that for most people outside this room, let's say most non-scientists, and even some scientists, they have a dangerously false image of what science is all about. Namely, only one of the two, let me say, complementary sides. The popular view, the first view, is from the public part of science. You know, from textbooks, from narrowly focused courses, from uh, published papers that for good or ill follow the old advice of uh, Louis Pasteur to his students, make it look inevitable. <laughs> Very wise, because you keep all your private stuff out, and therefore less to fight on you. It's a sociological uh, uh, device. Very interesting and very important. Very different in the humanities, of course, and uh, to their disadvantage in many cases. So, but all these, this view, this first view, uh, gives uh, to the wider public a very sterile, a very forbidding picture for many how the results really were produced by real people. That is why science out there is often called merely mechanistic. Perhaps this view makes it also easier for policymakers to turn against scientific evidence. But there is this other complementary side of science, the art, the science in the making, the human adventure, the long, long wait, the bearing of soul and of teeth sometimes, and uh, of euphoria or despair, and the use of intuition, of visualization, of uh, private skills, of holding on to your thematic idea despite all evidence to the contrary. That comes out in these holdings of the Niels Bohr Library and the archives. And uh, again and again, uh, there is something completely different from the first view of science. This second largely kept secret way of science is just what comes out here. And uh, it uh, also is in the letters and interviews and so on, which can be accessed from here to other places around the world. So this is made available by the staff here of the direct inspection in this building 
on the exhibits which they launch uh, for meetings, in personal responses and advice, and that in turn percolates then to the wider public in textbooks with a more humanistic sort of courses uh, of the work of the large community of science history uh, scholars. Well, I have no illusions that all this alone can turn the tide, which is much of, in much of academia, at least, is still pushed forward by the believers in the Nietzschean uh, saying, there are no facts, there are only interpretations. But ours is an essential part of a long fight to keep science regarded as a vital part of culture, just as Oppenheimer said 50 years ago. You may have to forgive me for what I'm about to say, but I believe deeply that the adherence to the search for veracity <clears throat> and reality, which comes through in these archival recordings, that this characterizes science in a way which is crucial for the persistence of democracy itself. It was not an accident that Thomas Jefferson and company, in their very first sentence in the Declaration of Independence, said that the reason for having this Declaration of Independence, for being no longer part of an old empire, but to be a new democracy, something new on the globe, um, it rested in good part on belief in the laws of nature. The rationality, the veracity, part, the laws of nature are part of the reason for democracy to exist. And if you don't believe in the laws of nature, democracy has become very vulnerable. As some of you may recall, I have also the hope that the better understanding of the way physics has developed can firm up a sense of self in the scientists as a whole. A physicist is not only a pioneer, at the frontier facing the future, he, he or she is also an inheritor of a long history of efforts of often unacknowledged persons. Each of us is standing as a scientist, not just on, a, on the shoulders of a few giants, we are also standing on the graves of thousands, often unacknowledged people that made our work possible. Especially in these many interviews, you realize that the fine work of most physicists is hugely indebted to the previous pioneering of others. The advance of any of us is like the fruit on a big family tree. We are all family. Greg, the good will, of course, give the best answers to what will be the future of the enterprise. As for me, as I close here, I see two sets of vast treasures, which is something the enterprise here will have to, to deal with. <clears throat> one is internal to science and one is external to science. Internally, the pressures are that physics uh, and the physical sciences are growing. The community is vastly increasing since those days 50 years ago. There are now mega teams, there are mega data, there's globalization and internationalization of the community and its work, and there's greater rule of interdisciplinarity. Forty percent of my tenured faculty in the Department of Physics at Harvard, forty percent of them have now also a professorship in another department, chemistry, astronomy, uh, history of science in a couple of cases, uh, biology, the field is losing the edgedness of departments, which, by the way, is of course an invention of deans. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the problems are oozing out into other areas, and this is going to be a part of the work here on a large scale. So, then there are external pressures on our work to be done here. The ever greater interaction of science with technology and with polity, and again, Oppenheimer is an icon for that. The heavy reliance of the country GDP on what comes out of science and engineering, and I wish there were more economists other than Solo and Inkelis who have really worked on the 
magnificent contribution to GDP that comes out of the research laboratories. The repairs so badly needed in science education it will come to the task here in a strong and strong way. And last but not least, I see the need to spread ever more effectively the dearest values of science itself. As they are revealed in the holdings here, despite all the limitations as mere humans, we have witness here in the documents of our profession's dedication to a habit of truthfulness, unlike in other places, and to the search for an ever deeper understanding of this glorious universe of ours. Thank you.